Hello friends, welcome to this video on the Barrett's esophagus. The Barrett esophagus. This is a condition where we have a metaplastic change of the normal esophageal squamous epithelium to columnar epithelium which has a goblet cells also. So this is a normal esophagus where the mucosa is lined by the squamous epithelium. Then we have submucosa, mucosa, submucosa, we have a circular layer of the muscle, then longitudinal muscle and adventitia. Now this squamous epithelium which is present in the normal esophagus, it is replaced uh, into the columnar epithelium and this columnar epithelium has the goblet cells also. So this columnar epithelium with the goblet cells, we call it as an intestinal metaplasia. Now uh, this Barrett's esophagus we see in 10% of the individuals who have the gastroesophageal reflex disease. That is only the main cause for the Barrett's esophagus. That is what I told you, the gastroesophageal reflex disease. Now normally what happens when we take the foot the bolus of the foot as it passes through the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter, it relaxes and the bolus passes into the stomach. Now once it passes into the stomach, the sphincter again closes very tightly so that the content of the gas, uh, the stomach or the gastric contents, they do not uh, reflex back into the esophagus. They remain within the stomach itself. What happens in some patients, they have the loosening of this uh, sphincter. If the sphincter cannot be tightened uh, or it cannot be tightly closed. So this occurs in certain conditions where we have uh, connective tissue disorders like in the scleroderma or the patients uh, who have the habit of the smoking in obesity, pregnancy and in the patients who have a delayed gastric emptying. These are some of the causes uh, where we can have this gastroesophageal a reflex. So in this condition where you have uh, the loosening of this lower esophageal sphincter which cannot be tightly closed, the gastric contents they reflex back into the esophagus. So the acid content which is present in this uh, in this gastric contents, the acid it causes damage to the esophageal mucosa and we have that metaplastic change. Now the risk factors for the Barrett's esophagus is uh, the first one is the patient, the elderly patients who are above, above or nearly 60 years of the age. Men are three to four times uh, they have the more risk than the women and Caucasians they have the increased risk. Along with that the tobacco and the alcohol consumption they are the stronger risk factors. Uh, actually not the smoking uh, but chewing of the tobacco it has a more risk in, for the development of the Barrett's esophagus. Now why the Barrett's esophagus is so important is there is increased risk of development of the esophageal adenocarcinoma from that metaplastic columnar epithelium. That's why this Barrett's esophagus has a clinical importance. Now coming to the pathogenesis, like uh, how what is the mechanism of this change of the squamous epithelium to the columnar epithelium? So the potential mechanism uh, what has been described are the trans differentiation and trans commitment. These are the two processes by which the squamous epithelium will be changing into the columnar epithelium or we have the columnar epithelium developing in place of the damaged squamous epithelium. Now what is the differentiation and trans commitment. So trans differentiation is the process in which fully differentiated squamous cells they change into fully differentiated columnar cells. So you see here this is a squamous epithelium and whenever there is an injurious stimuli this squamous epithelium will change into the columnar epithelium. So this is fully differentiated not the immature cells but they are fully differentiated squamous cells which are changing into fully differentiated columnar cells. That was trans differentiation. Trans commitment, this is the process in which we have immature progenitor cells. These immature progenitor cells actually they differentiate into different cell types. They are programmed to differentiate into certain cell types. So whenever there is an injurious stimuli or uh, like what we have seen in this condition like in the gastroesophageal reflex disease whenever there is an injurious stimuli these immature progenitor cells they differentiate abnormally like if uh, 
uh, when if they are programmed to differentiate into one cell type when there is an injury they differentiate into another cell type so they differentiate abnormally why this happens is the differentiation is the factors which cause the damage like the gastroesophageal reflex disease the acid or the bile salts which are present in that regurgitate they activate certain signaling pathways like hedgehog pathway or bmp4 pathway now these pathways in these cells they control the activity of the transcription factors which are responsible for uh, the development of the cell phenotypes so when there is some abnormality in the signaling pathways because of this injurious stimuli then the cell phenotype also will change because these pathways are controlling the transcription factors that regulate the development of the cell phenotype so whenever there is an abnormality in the signaling pathway obviously the differentiation also will change so this is trans commitment trans differentiation is matured epithelium changing into another matured epithelium whereas trans commitment is immature progenitor cells which are destined to differentiate into another type of the epithelium now they have described some four groups of the cells that give rise to the barrett's metaplasia this was given by the q et al according to him four types of the cells can give rise to the barrett's metaplasia so one was either the basal cells which are present in the this is the squamous epithelium whenever there is an injury stimuli the basal cells of this squamous epithelium they first differentiate differentiate into transitional type of the cells and this transitional type of the cells later they differentiate into metaplastic columnar epithelium so the here this metaplastic columnar epithelium has developed from the basal cells of the squamous epithelium this is one group of the cells another group of the cells is the cells of the esophageal submucosal glands and the ducts so the adjacent squamous epithelium whenever it is injured these uh, cells of the submucosal glands or the ducts they start differentiating into the metaplastic columnar epithelium this is the second type of the cells then the third group of the cells are directly the cells of the proximal stomach we have a cardioesophageal junction so we have uh, the foveolar cells of the stomach so these cells directly they start differentiating into metaplastic columnar epithelium and this is the third group of the cells then fourth group of the cells are we have certain reserve embryonic cells of the totipotential cells which are present at the esophagogastric junction so whenever there is an injury stimuli to the squamous epithelium these uh, reserve embryonic cells they start differentiating into metaplastic columnar epithelium which replaces the damaged squamous epithelium so these are the four different types of the cells from which there can be the metaplastic columnar epithelium so metaplastic columnar epithelium can develop from all these four types of the cells now uh, these uh, intestinal metaplasia what we have seen the columnar epithelium it can also develop certain dysplastic changes and this dysplastic change we usually see in 0.2% of 0.2% to 2% of the uh, cases and from this dysplasia the patient will develop later on the adenocarcinoma and uh, these cells which have the dysplasia they have demonstrated certain oncogenic mutations also so presence of dysplasia it is it were it is found to be associated with certain factors like if the patient has a prolonged symptoms then there is a chance of developing the dysplasia or the segment of the esophagus which is involved is longer then there is a risk of development of the dysplasia if the patient's age is more then also he is of increased risk and the caucasian race these uh, are the factors which are associated with the presence of the dysplasias now when we see grossly how does this barrett esophagus appears so grossly when we see the endoscopic view is it appears as the tongue or the patches of the red velvety mucosa and seeing here these are the tongues or the patches of red velvety mucosa which are extending upward upward above the gastroesophageal junction and this uh, tongue of the red velvety mucosa they will be alternating with the pale squamous mucosa of the normal esophagus and uh, at the bottom this red velvety mucosa it will be interfacing with the brown colored gastric mucosa 
Now this is the endoscopic view when you are seeing this red colored patchy uh, tongue like red colored velvety mucosa is nothing but the Barrett mucosa and in between you are seeing this pale color this is the normal squamous epithelium. This is the endoscopic view. And again depending upon the segment of the esophagus involved it has been subclassified into three types. So first was ultra short segment where you have extension of this Barrett mucosa uh, which, um, which will be extending less than one centimeter in the length. So we have a very short segment that's why they have called it as ultra short segment. Then another type is where you have this tongue like um, projections of the metaplastic epithelium extending uh, less than 3 centimeters from the gastroesophageal junction. This is a short segment. Now if the involvement is present uh, more than 3 centimeters from the gastroesophageal junction then we call it as a long segment Barrett esophagus. So in this way we have three types depending upon the length of the involvement of the esophageal mucosa. Now when you have a longer segment, long segment involvement, this has more risk of developing the dysplasias. So risk of dysplasia, it correlates with the length of the involved mucosa. Now when you see the microscopy, that was the gross appearance. Then when you see the microscopy, as I told you, we have the squamous epithelium which has been replaced by the intestinal type of the Metaplasia. Intestinal type of metaplasia means nothing but you have the columnar cells along with the goblet cells. Now what are these goblet cells? The goblet cells, they have a distinct mucus vacuole which will stain pale blue on hematoxylin and eosin staining. And this mucin which is present in the cytoplasm, it gives the shape of wine goblet to the cytoplasm. I'll show you the diagram, you'll understand. So we have columnar cells, then we have goblet cells. And then we have the dysplasia also can be present and this dysplasia is classified as a low grade and high grade depending upon the cytological features. This is the microscopic picture. So you have a squamous epithelium, you have a metaplastic columnar epithelium and this blue colored things what you are seeing are the goblet cells. Now these goblet cells they stain pale blue on hematoxylin and eosin. And because the mucin is present in the cytoplasm, as I told you, it gives the shape of wine goblet. This is the wine goblet. So you see the shape of this wine goblet. It, these cells have a similar shape because of the presence of the mucin in the cytoplasm. So this is the microscopic picture. And here when you see at the gastroesophageal junction, you see this uh, microphotograph is from the gastroesophageal junction where you have a squamous mucosa then from the squamous mucosa you have the cardiac fovular cells present here and the, similarly you have this uh, microphotograph from the um, this Barrett esophagus now here you see the squamous epithelium then you have a metaplastic columnar epithelium and you have a goblet cells if you see the difference in the cardiac mucosa you don't see the goblet cells you have these fovular cells which also have the mucin in the cytoplasm but definitely these are different from the goblet cells this sort of the goblet cells we see in the large intestines so that's why when we see the epithelium which is having this columnar cells along with the goblet cells we call it as intestinal metaplasia instead of simply calling it as a columnar metaplasia we call it as intestinal metaplasia another microphotograph you can see this is a columnar these all are the columnar epithelium and these cells are the goblet cells which are present in between and this is a high part view you can make out these are the goblet cells and in between you have the columnar cells Now, as I told you, from the uh, normal Barrett esophagus without any dysplasia, the patient can develop the low-grade dysplasia. Now, low-grade dysplasia means you have some abnormality in the glandular architecture. Then you have irregular shapes and you have a cellular crowding. This is because the cells are proliferating. You have the cellular crowding and cells will show the hyperchromatic nucleus with a mild increase in the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, just mild increase in nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. Now, after some time from low grade dysplasia, the patient may progress to high grade dysplasia. High grade dysplasia means here you have a large hyperchromatic nuclei will be present. Cellular architectural changes 
psychological and architectural changes will be very severe but the only thing is the cells are confined above the basement membrane no cell will invade into the stroma so if you see such uh, severe uh, dysplastic change but still they are confined above the basement membrane we call it as a high grade dysplasia then later on these dysplastic cells they develop they uh, break open the basement membrane and they invade into the mucosa so once you have the epithelial cells invading the lamina propria we call it as adenocarcinoma so in this way from the barrett's esophagus patient develops low grade dysplasia then it goes to high grade dysplasia and the patient will develop the adenocarcinoma now for giving the diagnosis of the barrett's esophagus the patient should have uh, both the endoscopic evidence of the abnormal mucosa and also he should have the histological evidence of the intestinal metaplasia both should be present to diagnose a person having the barrett esophagus now what are the clinical features of this of the patient having the barrett esophagus the patient can present with a hard burn in digestion he can have hematemesis or the blood in the stool there can be difficulty in swallowing the solid foods or there can be the nocturnal regurgitation but the most common symptoms which which the patient will present are the heart burn and indigestion what is the treatment for the barrett esophagus so if the patient has non dysplastic barrett esophagus or with a low grade dysplasia then we have to treat only the gastroesophageal reflux disease so treatment of this gerd by using the proton pump inhibitors or h2 histamine receptor antagonist is enough to reduce the gastric acidity but the patient should be called for the endoscopic surveillance for every 2 to 3 years and these patients they have 6 to 28% risk of developing high grade dysplasias because they have the risk of developing high grade dysplasias and later on adenocarcinomas endoscopic surveillance for every 2 to 3 years is a must then if the patient has a high grade dysplasia both high grade dysplasia and the invasive mucosal carcinomas they both can be treated in the similar way they both can be treated with either with the esophageal mucosal ablation therapy using the laser what we call it as a laser ablation or esophageal mucosal resection what we call it as a mucosectomy or if the involvement is large then the patient can undergo the esophagectomy so this treatment can be given both for high grade dysplasias and also for the invasive carcinomas so this is about the treatment of the barrett esophagus thank you friends uh, and please don't forget to give your comments which are very valuable for me for improving my classes thank you for listening patiently